Honorable Gail Brewer, Brian Lafferty, Sue Je Jessica Madison, excuse me. Victoria Amarda Kortov. Here. Yesenia Cardona. Here. Claudia Kodjer. Here. Menia Colon is excused. Cynthia Cox. Here. The the Honorable Mayor de Blasio Harold Miller. Wanupa Teshon. The Honorable Ruben Diaz. Monica Major.
an enjoyable summer. Can't believe it flew by and we're already at back to school time. So for those who have kids in school, I hope your kids are having a great first week of school. My daughter graduated high school this past year, so selfishly I'm happy I don't have to worry <laughs> about back to school stuff. Um, she's starting uh, college to begin the next year, so I probably have a break for the first time in many years. So I don't feel for you parents out there, but it's exciting to see the kids uh, back to school and getting back into uh, a routine. Thank you again for your attendance today and again for achieving quorum. I know we put a lot of emphasis on that, but that's extremely important. So I appreciate everyone's diligence in, in making sure uh, that happens. So as we move through our agenda, first order of business is the minutes from our last meeting on June 13th. Um, it was emailed out, so hopefully everyone did have an opportunity to review that. But if there aren't any questions or concerns at the moment regarding those minutes, I will now entertain a motion to accept the minutes from the full cap meeting on June 13th. Uh, so moved, yeah. The properly moved by Joseph Pierre. Second. Second by Linda Walters. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, abstaining, there being none, so moved. Thank you for that. So in a bit of board correspondence, we do have a few members we'd like to recognize. Um, recognition of the election of, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Patane Williams, who is now the chairperson of NAB Brooklyn 17, as NAB Brooklyn's chairperson representative. Also, we have the recognition of Daniel Garcia McGuire as representative for the public advocate office of Jemani Williams. Um, and the re recognition of the Nuri Renara, I hope I'm pronouncing that cor correctly, I'm sorry if I'm not, uh, as representative for the council member, uh, Debbie Rose. So I'll read, oh, this is in addition. Okay, so let me read the letters for the ones I just announced that is here. Dear Director Bernard, this letter is to designate Daniel Garcia McGuire as my delegate to the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development, Community Action Board, effective this date. Please accept and seat Mr. Garcia McGuire accordingly. Sign Public Advocate Jamani Williams. Uh, next up from the Office of City Council, Debbie Rose. Dear Sir Madam, as you know, I have appointed Isaac Cortez Rogers as my representative at DYCD's Community Advisory Board. When Ms. Cortez Rogers is unavailable to attend a full board meeting, uh, as well as subcommittee meetings of the CAB, I designate Ms. Venuri Renaudi, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly again, to attend as my representative in her place. Please let me know if you have any questions regarding the above. Sincerely, Council Member Debbie Rose. Dear Mr. Hamburg, I am appointing Eliza Crespo, liaison of education and youth services to attend the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development, Community Action Board meetings on behalf of my office. If you have any questions, please contact Monica Manger my Director of Education and Youth Services. Sincerely sign the Office of Ruben Diaz, Jr. So I'd like to entertain a motion now to recognize and accept these new members that I've announced. Mm -hmm. properly moved by Joseph Pierre. Second. Seconded by David Alexander. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposing, abstain. There being none, so moved. Um, as always, it's good to add members to the CAB, so let's have a round of applause for these new members that we recognize. Ms. Presto, you're here. We appreciate your attendance here. Anything you'd like to say to address the CAB at this time? Thank you. And Ms. Isaac Cortez Rogers. It's Issa. 
Issa, okay, I am so sorry. I'll make sure I say the right way, go for it. Okay, I'm gonna practice that, I promise. Thank you. Anything you'd like to say to address the board? Okay, perfect. Thank you, we appreciate it. So we thank you for that. So next up, I'm gonna bring up the Deputy Commissioner Gutierrez, who's gonna introduce some guests we have here at the meeting today. Sorry to say the summer is over, but we have a lot of exciting work to do, and um, we've been busy, very busy. But before we get on to my updates, I want to introduce you to someone who is in our lives a lot, <laughs> right? Um, his name is Manny Rosa, and he is the director of. He has a long title. Uh, Remind me what the, the title is, Director of the Division of, Community Division of Community Services for the Department of State. So I'm reading his bio over here and it's a long thing. So he, I could read it to you and I'll tell you that he's had pretty important positions. So among them, the, he was the Deputy Director of the New York Governor's Office of Hispanic Affairs, he was the Assistant Secretary for the Governor for Human Services. He was the Director of New York State Office for Minority Health, Assistant Vice President for Intergovernmental Affairs and Community Affairs, and New York State Community Health and Hospital. So I could go on. You want me to go on? No. Okay. <laughs> so it matters none that I could read out all those titles because he must be some. Somebody really important to be able to have gotten to all those titles and for people to respect him in those roles. But and I've seen Manny in a few in a few meetings, right? Um, and he's always very manageable. So this is the first time I ever seen him in a community meeting, and I finally met the guy. Please meet Manny Rosa. His passion comes through when he with his people, and he's one of us. Welcome, Manny. I'm so glad. for a new two-year state plan 
It's an application that has to be approved uh, by the federal government, the Department of Health and Human Services, that in essence provides us the okay to spend their money. Uh, and as you know, uh, and I want to thank uh, my father here, who's also a partner, and Justice Anthony McNair, who's been so gracious in my, in my short time I've been here for about 15 months. Um, the partnership, and I, and I talk about partnership, is who we serve. So we are, at the Department of State, servants of the people. That's, that's the attitude that I have. We need to listen, to work with, to explain, literally, uh, what we do. Uh, as we make decisions, to do so in partnership where we can, uh, first and foremost, and then if there's a disagreement for whatever reason that I have to prove something, then as I would say to my colleagues, I will explain why we cannot. It's not just a no. I've been in government long enough, that, that resume that the Deputy Attorney General was reading uh, has taught me over the years the importance of communication between we in government and those that we are supposed to be serving, yes, not ordering around, um, and in essence to act as a resource. So yes, we have to monitor the money because that is our state goal. But we also have to act as a resource for those agencies that may need a little help. And, and that's not necessarily here at DYPD because this is a remarkable agency. And when you have 280 plus delegate agencies, you know that throughout the five boroughs in New York City, uh, that work is going to get done, especially with the support of you know the primary contractor, which is DYPD. But I can tell you in Sussex County, we have one contractor for Sussex County. And in Nassau County, we have one contract for so it doesn't necessarily jive that through population we're going to be having all kinds of uh, agencies to implement the CS or the uh, Senior Services Lockdown. And the other problem is, and I, I just went through this through the public hearing, that we are restricted, constricted literally, by the mandate of working with people at 125% of the poverty level and not higher. Now, we live in New York, right? So, I mean, we're dealing, obviously, with the poorest of the poor. And the challenge is even made greater as demographics change, and, and now we have this influx of immigrants and refugees that are going to be scared because of the news coming out of Washington to apply for the services that they need. So, our jobs then become more challenging, yes? Our advocacy becomes more important. Our knowledge of what's going on on the ground becomes even more crucial in terms of letting those officials who can make certain decisions, whether they be in Congress or they be in the state legislature or city hall, whatever the case may be, our voices need to be heard. And sometimes we have to work in unison to get that message through. So that when we talk about partnership, it is I know what you're doing. I know what it is when a particular person knocks on their door, on your door, right, and says, I need help. And it's just not ordinary help. I'm about to be homeless, or I am homeless, or I'm hungry. Worst words in the United States, I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. OK? A, a, a child is homeless. We can't get to school. And, and I've been dealing with this for 40 some odd years now. All right? And I teach at Queens College. And, and the one thing that I talk about in my classes is, especially when we talk about poverty, it's just always been poverty. <coughs> Right? And Olga Mendes, when she left to teach one day, said to me, I know now why they have poor people, because there's a business behind poor people. Wow. And that was an impactful statement to me when, you know, when we were up in Auburn. CSDG should not be the business of poor people, but, but the mission to help and be the bridge for those individuals. And that's what we are doing to, in Auburn. I have most of the, uh, my colleagues are in the Albany office. We have an office in Buffalo. We have an office in Syracuse, and believe it or not, in Watertown. And I'm down here in the city, and I go up to Albany, and we try to monitor 52 grantees. And that includes three uh, Native American tribal uh, nations. And, the, and it's a gamut, right? The, the, we have one contract, for example, that works with uh, here in, in the Bajo uh, with uh, reentry. But not just reentry of, of young people coming in, but people who have been in the system for 9, 10, 11 years on average. 
And the major challenge for them is to re-socialize those individuals that they feel that they are human beings and then somehow find them a job and some income. That's part of the work that we do. In other places, we give a simple thing like a backpack, you know, for school, if you come to school, you open it up. But there's also a part of me associated with that, a meal, right? A shelter, clothes, the program that uh, we work out of Syracuse, for example, that is college prep. And we actually buy clothes for these young students so that when they apply, they're dressed properly. That's what CSPG is all about, okay? But CSPG is also about rules and regulations that we have to work with and around and through. And CSPG is, you know, when Amy comes down and works with uh, GYPD and visits a couple of programs here and there to get to know what you all are doing. Why? Because if we are audited, the person that they're going to speak to is standing right in front of you. My name is plastered all over that application, so there's a company first. I don't know what's going on. No? So I'm hoping and praying that tonight is just the beginning of this long friendship that we can have, that I can visit your program, get to know what you're doing, and then you tell me in turn, Maddie, I you ever think about doing it this way, or uh, can I give you a suggestion? Because I think it is really important that we dialogue, and not monologue, and that we get a sense from the people in the trenches, in the street. I've worked on 129 students, but I was one for Okay? Yeah. That was all president, right? That was president of <laughs> I'll tell you why I'm even more of a Bronx boy, okay? The Bronx Royal Commission, I have to see my wife. Okay. Oh, right? okay. So if I was in the Bronx world before, now I really am, right? I better be. So the idea of this, this linkage between the five boroughs that I have put in almost every borough in this long resume, understanding that, frankly, the challenges that we have, and, and I will say this about you as well. The one thing I learned about uh, the, my, the cab members at HSC was how passionate a lady, Helen Atkinson, she rest in peace, who would come to the meeting wearing her oxygen, she had her oxygen, and come into the meeting and not miss a meeting. And she was in her 80s. Okay. Now, if I can't be inspired by that, then nothing is going to inspire any of us, frankly. But more than inspiration, I'm going to respect that as well in my position. Right? If I know the girl president of the Bronx, then I do. And his father, and I do and so many other elected officials that I've worked for, that I understand very frankly that when people come to your offices, right, when people come to this agency, they're not asking you, they're asking, I'm, I'm, I'm in desperate need, I need some help. That's the passion and that's the understanding that I need to bring into my position as director of the division. Okay, so I don't know it all. I will never know it all. Okay, I've been, like I said, I've been in this business, I, I, every, every time something else comes new, I say, oh, I didn't know that, right? Amy's my teacher. I depend very heavily on her and her colleagues, very frankly. I depend on you. We can only work uh, DCS, the Division of Human Services, uh, as well as this partnership works, okay? Uh, and that's the communication, and I thank you, Commissioner, for talking about the commission, and, and I can I try to talk all the time, all right? And, and one of the things that we are going to try to do with DYPD, we just started a, a couple of months ago, have these quarterly meetings between uh, my office and members of the uh, staff so that we can get to understand a little bit more some of the challenges that DYPD has because they are our largest grant provider. They are our largest grant to the state. So it's uh, you know, the importance of what you do. So if New York State is going to look good on the team, CSPG, then New York City has to lead the way. And New York City is going to lead the way, then they really all need to know what we're doing out of Albany. Albany is about 150 miles from here, but for some people it might be 150,000 miles. They don't know. They don't know what's going on there. And I know that for a fact. I work in the state legislature and I used to have to come back here to South Bronx. And people say, why is your boss always away? Why can't he be here? Department of State is run by Rosana Rosado, a passionate advocate 
to the secretary, and now the secretary happens to be an advocate for the district. And she will remind us about our role and our moments in the movie, as we call it. Our little role, our two minute segment in the movie. And because of that, we are reminded constantly of our obligation to you. So I hope that we will continue this dialogue. Again, I thank you very much. Um, Hopefully, I don't know if the, if the agencies get have our numbers up in all this, but if not, we'll make sure that you do, um, so that it's more than just me coming down here and just saying blah, 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 but rather, you know, let's, let's talk. Let's, let's speak to each other. Uh, and I thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for that, Annie, your presence here. I think it means a lot to this body here and uh, the partnership. And you touched on a, a, a lot of things that I think is kind of, if I had to sum up like the job description of a community action board member, it's a lot of what you said. Um, and I can speak with certainty, the feedback you would want, the honest feedback, you would have no problem <laughs> getting that from this group of individuals here, because, you know, this is not a club. People are not coming here to just say, we come into a community at action board meeting, get committed, and your, your, your remarks uh, mean a lot, so we appreciate your presence here. Uh, I really appreciate it. <laughs> the honest truth. Yeah, That's the way to do Thank you. Uh, and Amy, it's good to see you again. I know Manny's the man, you know, but he's still on the front there. Anything you want to say? I know you're, you're here, but anything you want to say to CAD? Whatever moment. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so now I'm gonna ask August to come up, who's gonna give us our financial and quarterly report, and as she comes up, just a little bit of housekeeping information. You probably were handed this contact information sheet, or hopefully was handed this as you came in. Uh, please fill this out. If it seems like you're filling this out two or three times a year, you're probably right. Um, but we have to make sure that we have the most up-to-date information and we have new members um, and it's not only for do you like CDs record keeping but it's to make sure we have all your contact information so we can properly give information to you so while you're here today uh, please fill this out they'd like to collect this at the uh, end of the meeting thank you It's not 
about um, information and the executive expenditure. So we're going to talk mostly about children. So the year which just started, a lot of providers are getting up and running. They haven't submitted their invoices, and this is very much the norm. So don't be alarmed. But for the new members, I'd like to talk about how we allocate the CDB funds we receive. We receive, um, for the city fiscal year 20, we have $34.1 million. And this, don't, don't be alarmed, this is just the federal, this is just the city fiscal year budget. I know you know what the federal award is, but this is my city fiscal year perspective. We have $34.1 .1 million, and we've allocated $60 million of that to the MBA um, portfolio, which is about seven different subcategories. We have a program on housing, we have a program on seniors, we have a uh, opportunity to use program, we have a program for education, um, and healthy family. So there's about seven categories of that $60 million. We have close to $600,000 in the Immigration Rescue Assistance Program. We um, sent our sister agency $2.1 million to extend on legal services. Uh, we have an adult education program, NICAWI, of $500,000. The Fatherhood, one of our largest programs as well, is $2.8 million. Adolescent literacy, just over 800,000. And the FYP and other of our larger programs is $4.6 million. Together, that represents 81% of our CFPB funding. We spend an additional 6% on audit and capital services. And the bulk of that is their technical assistance. We allocate some money for fiscal review fiscal peer review where we have talked with an audit team to go out and visit the CBOs to make sure that they're uh, keeping their books the way they're supposed to. Um, we have a payroll service that's part of the FYP program. Uh, and then the other categories such as marketing, publications, and so on, um, Mike and his team use this funding to support our CBOs. Um, we spend a 14 million, 14 percent on DYC personnel. Um, that's $4.7 million. So you can see the bulk of this CFPB funding, the 81% plus the 6%, 87% is spent on ser direct services or supporting direct services. Otherwise, we spend um, a lot less of that money in admin. I want to also point out that if you look at the um, payments column, we're actually paid out more than we receive in expenditures. And, and why is that? It's because DYC provides our uh, CBOs with an advance if they require it. So these are mostly small agencies. They don't have um, cash flow as more sophisticated agencies in the community. They can request an advance. So we would give them an advance 25% of their award up front without them submitting an invoice to us. And then come January, we start to recoup that advance. So uh, when they submit their July through December invoice, we will pay 100% of that. But when they submit their invoice in January, we'll start to, if they submit an invoice for $5,000, we'll probably pay them $4,000 until we have recouped that advance. So as the year goes on, uh, around the January meeting, you'll notice that the payment number is much higher than the year-to-date expenditures. Uh, that covers it. Um, there's not a lot of expenses, as I said, because these are, uh, they're starting their programs running. They're not, the fiscal issue is not as depressing right now as uh, their programmatic um, program, their programmatic operation. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, I'm neither Curry or Wong, but I'm Social Security. I'm Hi, I'm Dr. Gerard. Just say your name for the record, please. Sorry. process takes a while. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all through summer, 
five-star hotel, right? It's like the best of the best. So far, we've done uh, these community needs assessment. Every time that we do them, it gets better and better and better. And she's gonna describe that very exciting process. But to begin with, we've already uh, started to do, to collect surveys, and some of you have helped us with that. Um, we, there were 208 uh, members that were, that were trained. Um, another, another 100 that were trained, you know, individually, go, we trained some people in groups. And, um, and then we also did two of the uh, public hearings for the two uh, places in Queens, the local uh, entities in Queens, uh, NDAs in Queens that are new, right? We explained that the last time about how the boundaries work and all of that, and we even did that presentation. So there were two in Queens that we had to do public um, meetings with them, and so we invited the community and they, um, they sort of uh, gave us a, a chance to explain about the boundaries, and we also got a lot of interest in, in, in those people becoming members for, the, for those NDAs. Now, be clear that those, um, that all of that process that's happening now with the community's assessment for the new boundaries, for everybody, but particularly for those two boundaries where we don't have uh, NADs yet, we're going to be um, recruiting them, but those are the people that then will be doing some of the surveys that we're, do that we're doing now. So we're still in that process of, of training those folks and it's very new to them, uh, but we are in that process. Um, one of the things that we do to get ready to collect these surveys is that we participate in uh, National Night Out. How many people were at the event? Okay, so you know that we have tables and the, the entities uh, are in those, um, are at those sites, and they collect a lot of surveys at, at those sites. Um, but it's also a way to, to tell people the NADs exist. We not only collect surveys, but we also fund these programs in the community, and you probably don't even know some of the programs that you have, but they are funded by CSBG. So it's a way for us not just to market, because I hate that word market, because it's not just about marketing, it's telling the community, this is what exists in your community, and this is what we do, and this is who we are. So this year we had a lot of, um, we had a, a lot of participation. I think it was, what, what was it, like 300 and, several hundred? It was 38 boards. 38 boards, and how many people participated? Um, it was over 100 people participating. So a lot of, and, and a lot of DYCD staff also volunteered for that event. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of participation and a lot of buzz around the community needs assessment, but not just about the community needs assessment, it's also about the, the entities. Um, so I wanna, I wanna encourage you to participate in giving out surveys, collecting surveys and bringing them back to us, but also if you're not doing that, to tell people about it, tell people in your areas that you're assigned to that this is happening, okay? Um, everybody loves hearing about the the summer youth employment program, summer youth program. Greg, of course, is always um, uh, somebody who, who who hires. How many young people did you hire this year? Uh, two ninety. Wow. <laughs> okay, two hundred and ninety. That is a good <laughs> so there were seventy four thousand young people hired through SYP this year. It is crazy. I, I should have thought, I should have thought how, we, how that, that number has gone up each year because 
since I've been here, it keeps going. The, and the difference between SYP this year also was, and you know, um, CSG funds as some of SYP, right? The difference is that all the programs that happened this year were changed. It was a new RFP, and so there were very customized programs, right? So some of the programs were for kids who were uh, 13, who were 14 and to 16, and then 16 to 24. And there were, and some of them were uh, for young people who, who were, uh, who had special needs. So these, all these programs were very, very customized this time as opposed to a lot of that you, you know, you could, not that that was a terrible thing. I, I was a white, uh, uh, SYP kid and I turned out fine. And it was a lot of kids. <laughs> but that said, the program needed improvement. The city council helped with that improvement. The mayor helped with that, the mayor staff helped with that improvement. And so, it is a different program, like I said. The five-star hotel right now, right? So this is where we're going in the city and things keep getting better and better and better. Why do you think that these things keep getting better and better and better? Do, do you think all of a sudden somebody just decided that they want to get better? The voice of the people happened, right? The people like you, committees like you, boards like you, people who went to city council and said, this is not good enough. It's good, but it's not good enough. And that's how all of these changes really happened. And this war started back, back five years ago, four years ago. So again, this is just to confirm that your voice is so important in all of these changes. We would never have seen any of these changes and SYP and CNA and anything if your voice wasn't in it, if you hadn't given us your opinion and your ideas. And not only your opinion and ideas, but the need to change because we couldn't stay the same. And that's where we are right now. Uh, Manny talked about the CSDG refunding application and so did uh, Astrid, so I won't talk too much about that. They're still doing well on our MWDE um, work that we do in partnership with the state. Um, this year we were able to hit at least 86% of the target. And um, the, no the number that we were supposed to reach was uh, 965,000. Uh, uh, we ended up doing about 86% of that. Um, Mike has been a real um, advocate of doing these uh, financial clinics for CEOs. And so we did, in July and August, we did financial clinics for CEOs for those providers that we fund. And so one of the things that we wanted to do, again, getting better, 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 better. So one of the things that we kept having a lot of trepidation about was that, were, why were, we couldn't understand why people weren't spending. If somebody gives you a check, why don't you spend it? You gotta cash it, right? So we found that a lot of CEOs uh, were not spending their money the way that we would want them to spend 100% of the money. So there were some questions. And having been at ED, I know, man, you could relate to this. Um, being at ED at one point in my life, I knew that you can't come spend all your money because if you don't get it up front, you don't have it to spend, right? So if you can't give back uh, or get something to get reimbursed, there's no way you can spend the money. So if I owe you $10 and I owe you $10, I could pick who I'm gonna pay, right? And then that's how we, we get reimbursed. So there's a lot of dynamics that happen in community-based organizations that the, the inner workings of the financial matters of a CBO where they cannot spend that money and they only can spend that incrementally. Summer is the craziest time to spend money or not spend money because you have the young people all day long, right? And you're spending, you're going out to uh, parks or whatever. And, and so it's a very difficult thing to, to address. 
So Mike and his team really did some deep diving into what are the reasons and how could we help? How, how can we address those things first, right? What were the reasons? Were there some reasons that had to do with people just not knowing? Were there some reasons that had to do with people knowing but couldn't? Were there, were there some reasons that people were doing some other things that really weren't faring well for them? And so Mike uh, did that with his team and we are in, in the process of looking at all those recommendations and figuring out what recommendations and what training could we uh, develop for the community-based organizations so they could spend their money and then artists get paid, you know, it's 100% spent. Um, the federal budget. Um, according to the National Community Action Foundation, which I talked with you about, those are the people that, uh, that lobby for CSDD and community action agencies. There's no new information to report on the federal budget at this time. But USED will continue to um, keep you posted on that. And that, is that correct still? Okay, good. Uh, Finally, there's, um, next month we'll bring together uh, administrators of our CSDD programs as part of an agency-wide convening called uh, Stronger Together Collaborating for Resilience. Mike, do you want to say something about that? The Deputy Commissioner likes to point to great integration strategies. And so, as part of what we did after the 2016 community needs assessment, we brought together as many of the providers in the CSDD as we could and said, look, these are the needs. Like, we're not even going to change what we're funding. We just want to share this information with you, how does it impact your practice, what do you want to do with that information? And that was one of the many things that fed into the needs assessment we're doing now. So, we promised those CDOs that we would get back to them. And so, now, even though we haven't completed the needs assessment, we want to bring everyone together. So the Capacitability Unit has been doing a series of uh, workshops and meetings on resilience and strengthening the organizational capacity. So we were meeting with them about having a separate meeting, and then we started meeting with them about bringing our cohort into this larger meeting. And so, what, what, what did Joe catch? Was he got to catch two birds with one piece of bread? Yeah, so that's really what we are trying to do. And one of the things we just had a meeting today is the CSDD funded programs will talk about what's going on with the needs assessment, but we're also going to expose that to the CDOs that don't have CSDD contracts. And we're going to ask people some of the questions that are emerging that's going to feed directly into that concept that we're going to do next concept for, for NDS. We're actually kind of excited about that. So I want to close with saying that a lot of what Tony said
this this board just just because you can come for full quorum um, and make yourself known is the reason why we can do the work that we do and I really want to thank you. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner, for that report. Uh, and take a motion now to accept the Deputy Commissioner's report. So the proper rules say your name again. Been seconded by Cynthia Cox. All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposing, abstaining, there being none, so moved. Uh, thank you again, Deputy Commissioners. Great information. So, next up, we're going to go into our committee reports. The Executive Committee met uh, prior to this meeting, as we all always do to just recap a lot of the committee reports so i'm going to start with the government's committee report that's chaired by linda walters who will give you a summary of what took place in that meeting linda's over here um good evening everyone the committee met on august 21st and the minutes can be found on page 11 in the board packet there is now only one vacancy by the CAB, a male appointee that USCB is working to pass in. Staff report that the one CAB member is in jeopardy, sorry. Member in jeopardy attended the June 13th meeting and is therefore in good standing again. <clears throat> Turning minutes for fiscal year 2020. CAB officers, a new executive committee will be elected in April 2020. The committee will announce its slate at the January 2020 meeting. However, we are asking that board members begin now to think about nominations for chairpersons. Chairperson one, two, and three, vice chairperson, secretary, and parliamentarian. The official call for candidates will be made at the November 2019 meeting. CNA and CAB. NDA changes from current census information on populations in poverty. CAB Region 5 was NDA Bronx 9 and 10 is now NDA Bronx 9. CAB Regions number 16 was NDA Queens 1, 2, and 5, is now NDA Queens 1, 8, and 9. Oh, this is the CAB participation. <clears throat> CAB members are invited to participate in data collection, administering surveys in NDAs and public hearings. CAB orientation will be scheduled for October. The governance committee deals with all issues of board, board management and our meetings are quick and efficient. <laughs> Please consider joining the best committee of the CAB. <laughs> Thank you. questions regarding the governance committee report and just to reiterate we are uh, announcing the slate for the new executive committee earlier than we have in other meetings so we can think about uh, who whether it's yourself or someone else you feel should be uh, filling any of these roles as part of the executive committee so um, even though that won't take place until next year, um, feel free to think about filling those roles. Certainly, um, those who are in the roles can, can go for, the, for that role specifically again. Um, and if you have any questions in terms of the duties and the roles and responsibilities um, of those various positions within the executive committee, feel free to talk to any of the members of the executive committee anyone from BYCD to Anita, to Mike, Sandra, they'll be happy to uh, discuss that with you as well. Um, with that in mind, any other questions regarding Governor's Committee report? If not, I'll entertain a motion now to accept the Governor's Committee report. 
Proper vote by Linda Walters. Second by David Alexander. All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? Abstaining? There being none, so moved. Next up, Tamika Robinson with the program committee report. The challenge is on. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we met on August 14th um, to discuss details of the program committee. And if you refer to your page 12 of the board packet, you'll find these tabs. So one of the things that I'd like to highlight is the 2019 community needs assessment. Um, there's a lot of importance with that. One great um, aspect that came out of it was the staff reported on the NAD community needs assessment training in June that 85% had actually attended of the active app members and nine CAD members. But by uh, today, approximately 100 NAD members 